Inside this old factory in Haverhill, Massachusetts, you'll witness a rare sight in the United States. Artisans expertly building pianos by hand using century-old techniques. They're made by Mason & Hamlin, a company that's managed to outlast nearly every one of its competitors for the past 170 years. Entering their six-story factory is like going back in time. You'll notice hums, buzzes, the playing of notes, the repetition reverberate throughout the whole factory. Not long ago, piano factories like this were one of America's largest industries, employing tens of thousands of workers. Today, Mason and Hamlin are one of just two American piano makers left standing. The other is Steinway. Despite almost going bankrupt, how did Mason and Hamlin endure while so many other piano makers were forced to close down? And what keeps the business alive today? Until the late 1700s, the majority of pianos were built in Europe, first in Vienna and later in Great Britain. But by the 1800s, pianos had made their way to the United States, and soon a burgeoning manufacturing industry emerged, from Chicago to New York. This boom in piano production was coupled with hundreds of patent filings and aggressive marketing campaigns. The piano quickly became the centerpiece of American households. In Boston alone, close to 30 piano makers set up shop. Among them were Mason and Hamlin, aptly named after their founders. By the turn of the century, they had established themselves as a fan favorite amongst world-famed virtuosos. And in a gushing review, the Boston Globe declared they had conquered the music world. From 1880 to 1910, Mason and Hamlin's rise in popularity tracked closely with a massive increase in piano manufacturing across the US. Then, things came to a grinding halt. From 1920 to 1960, four major things happened that drastically changed the trajectory of the U.S. piano industry. First, the widespread adoption of cars and radios pulled Americans away from their favorite instrument. This step here is World War II, when factories had to pivot from building pianos to airplane motors. And by the 1960s, right as the industry was trying to recover, Yamaha and other Asian piano makers flooded the U.S. market at family affordable prices. By the mid-90s, only a few American manufacturers remained in business, including Mason and Hamlin, but they were on the verge of shutting down. Back in 1996, my father, Kirk, and my uncle, Gary, bought Mason and Hamlin out of bankruptcy. This was back when I was around seven years old. The piano is such a large instrument, and as a, a small child, you really don't grasp how complicated it is. Growing older and, and recognizing the amount of hours that goes into one of our instruments, it leaves me speechless. Since the piano is a musical instrument, a mechanism, and a furniture piece, it has more than 7,000 parts. It takes 300 plus hours to actually manufacture one of our pianos. We first start in the basement where we have the rim presses. Six long layers of hard rock maple are glued together to form a continuous rim. They'll raise the C-clamps up and then use a pneumatic drill to drill it in. You have the piano being shaped right then and there. Back in the golden age, piano designers and, and different workers would go back and forth to different companies. Each one had their own type of flavor of how they did things, how they pressed rims, and how they achieved crafting their, their pianos. Enter Richard Gertz, who was hired by Mason and Hamlin in 1895. When Richard Gertz came to Mason and Hamlin, he brought so many different innovative designs that other manufacturers did not want to take on. One of those designs was the crown retention system, and at the heart of it was a tension resonator, which among other things strengthens and preserves the shape of the rim, creating what Mason and Hamlin described as an indestructible tone. This is very unique and something that no other manufacturer does. Each of our craftsmen have a fingerprint in everything that they do with one of our instruments. At this moment, as they hand notch the bridge and sculpt the soundboard, nobody knows exactly how the piano is going to sound but all of that changes in the action department. Throughout the full steps on the fourth floor where we put in the actions, we make it a playable piano. 
The action is a delicate mechanism that has over 2,000 moving parts and is made of a variety of materials. Our strategy coming out of bankruptcy was to go back to the original designs and the original materials, but also innovate in areas where we could. Mason and Hamlin are one of the few manufacturers today that build their actions out of composite instead of a more traditional wood. Which is not affected by humidity, and so it lasts three times as long. Across the fourth floor, keys are put in, dampers assembled, tuning pins adjusted, and felt hammers perfectly calibrated to an exacting height. And that's done 88 times. Thanos handles the final step of the piano making process. He's a tone regulator and head technician. When a piano comes to Thanos, he needs an assortment of different tools. He's much like a surgeon. He goes and punctures those felt hammers to regulate the tone. Do we want a, a warmer tone, a brighter tone? It's a very quiet process that needs that attention to detail. Of course, these are living and breathing instruments and we're using organic materials. And so each one will have their unique sound, but they'll always have that Mason Hamlin sound. A lyrical tenor, thunderous, powerful bass, and a bell-like treble. While Steinway has become a global company, Mason and Hamlin have endured by sticking to their roots and making one of the sturdiest pianos in American history. It's something that is so much historical significance within the United States. There's a legacy of piano designers that have come before us. I think that's, that's so key, not forsaking where we come from, but innovating through that lens.